Herzlich willkommen, ja, herzlich willkommen im Radiokulturhaus. Meine Damen und Herren, Sie hören es vielleicht, ich bin ziemlich verkühlt und sollte eigentlich das Bett hüten. Ich komme aus dem Bett und stehe jetzt ein paar Stunden da und gehe auch dann wieder ins Bett. Und es ist nicht nur ich, mir geht so, sondern auch Eva Illus, die aus Tel Aviv zu uns angereist ist, ist krank. Ja, aber sie ist nicht so krank, dass sie nicht zu uns gekommen ist, wofür ich ihr, ihr sehr, sehr dankbar bin. Und außerdem wäre ich ganz gerne auch hier gewesen, weil Sie an so einem kalten Dezembertag die Mühen nicht gescheut haben, trotzdem ins Radiokulturhaus zu kommen. Dafür bin ich Ihnen sehr dankbar und haben Sie einfach nur ein bisschen Mitgefühl mit zwei kranken Rössern, die dann später hier auf der Bühne miteinander sprechen werden. <lacht> Seit mehr als zwei Jahrzehnten beschäftigt sich die weltweit bekannte Soziologin Eva Illutz mit den Veränderungen unserer Gefühlswelt in Zeiten des Kapitalismus. Gefühle nehmen im Konsumkapitalismus einen wahren Charakter an, Liebesbeziehungen und soziale Bindungen die auf Verbindlichkeit und Dauer ausgerichtet sind, werden dadurch zunehmend ausgehöhlt, zerstört oder auch leichtfertig beendet. In ihren Büchern »Warum Liebe wehtut« und »Warum Liebe endet« zeigt Eva Illutz, wie durch Selbstoptimierung und Kommerzialisierung des Intimlebens digitale Kommunikation und Dating-Apps das Gefühlsleben zutiefst verunsichert wird und die Beziehungen flüchtiger werden. Auch in ihrem neuesten Buch, das Glücksdiktat und wie es unser Leben beherrscht, kritisiert Eva Illutz die boomende kapitalistische Glücksindustrie. Diese will uns weismachen, dass wir Glück lernen müssen. Egal, wie sich die gesellschaftlichen Verhältnisse entwickeln, wenn wir glücklich sein wollen, sollen wir unsere negativen Gefühle blockieren und selbst optimieren und Achtsamkeit praktizieren. Dann, so das Heilsversprechen, komme auch das Glück. Doch in welche Richtung entwickelt sich eine demokratische Gesellschaft, wenn der Staat sich zunehmend nicht mehr für soziale Gerechtigkeit zuständig fühlt, wenn der Staat seinen Bürgerinnen und Bürgern die gesamte Verantwortung für das eigene Schicksal und Glück überträgt? Unterminiert Kapitalismus die Demokratie? Welche Möglichkeiten der Resilienz und des Widerstands gibt es angesichts dieser Entwicklungen. Der heutige Abend wird anders ablaufen als gewohnt. Erstens wird nach meiner Einführung nur mehr Englisch gesprochen. Zweitens ist der Abend in drei Teile geteilt. Er beginnt mit einem Vortrag von Eva Illutz zum Thema Das Capitalism Erode Democracy. Danach werden ich und Eva Illutz zum Thema anknüpfend an ein, also an ein Gespräch anknüpfend über Liebe und Glück in Zeiten des Kapitalismus führen. Und danach um etwa 20 Uhr gibt es eine kurze Pause und dann wollen wir noch ein paar Fragen zulassen, so ist unsere Gesundheit auch erlaubt, wo Sie auf Englisch oder auf Deutsch äh, fragen können. Die heutige Veranstaltung entstand in Kooperation mit dem Institut für die Wissenschaften von Menschen, denen ich sehr, sehr danke für die Organisation und auch für die Idee. Sie sind da dran geblieben und es war nicht so einfach. Es ist Dezember, <lacht> Sie wissen das, wie, dass, dass es nicht so leicht ist auch. Und Eva Illuz ist so viel auch in der Welt herum, in Paris und so, sie nach Wien zu bekommen. Und da sind wir sehr, sehr dankbar, dass das gelungen ist. Die Direktorin des IWM, Dr. Shalini Randeria, möchte ich jetzt auf die Bühne bitten, um das Vortragsthema und unseren heutigen Gast Eva Illutz vorzustellen. Ich darf Sie bitten. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren, herzlich willkommen. Ich traue mich gar nicht zu sagen, dass ich eigentlich kein gesund bin. 
Aber so ist es. Meine Stimme ist in Ordnung und ich möchte Sie ganz, ganz herzlich zu dem heutigen Abend begrüßen. So, on behalf of the IWM, I would like to extend a warm thanks to Johannes Kaup, Ö1 and the Radio Kulturhaus for organizing this event along with us. It's a great pleasure to welcome Eva Ilus this evening to deliver the lecture tonight as the third and the last of the IWM series of lectures in human sciences held this year. All three lectures addressed various aspects of the relationship between capitalism and democracy. The two previous lectures were given by Wolfgang Streeck and Danny Roderick, also here in Radio Kulturhaus. And Eva's lecture closes this series for us. Eva Iluz is currently professor of sociology at the School for Advanced Studies for Social Sciences in Paris and the Rose Isaac Chair of Sociology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She holds the Chair of Excellence at Paris Sciences Lettres and is furthermore the Heidi Fritz Nigli Guest Professor at the University of Zurich. Until very recently, I think until February this year, when I was corresponding with her, she has also been a fellow at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton. A lot of her writings in the last years have focused on the study of emotions, of culture, of communication, but also capitalism. In the tradition of the Frankfurt School, her work revolves around a critique of emotional capitalism, if we may call it that, and the ways in which capitalism transforms emotional patterns in products, consumption goods, and also transforms subjects and subjectivity. As a fellow at the Wissenschaftskolleg zu Berlin in 2008 and 9, Eva wrote in her contribution to the Wissenschaftskolleg Jahrbuch, and I cite her, she says, some of us wish they had been born in a different century. My century would have been the 18th century, not because of its revolutionary fever, but because this was the century of salons and coffee houses. Those places where the exchange of ideas was so seamlessly interwoven with casual friendships and where conversations were made into an art form. Welcome, Eva, to the city of coffee houses and of salons. Some of these places are still there in Vienna, a little bit changed, somewhat unchanged from the 18th century, and I hope you will find time tomorrow to visit and enjoy your time at one of these coffee houses. Eva Iluz is the author of a vast number of books and articles translated into 18 languages. In 2009, the German newspaper Die Zeit named her as one of the 12 thinkers most likely to change the thought of tomorrow. In 2018, she received the EMET Prize for Lifetime Achievement and Excellence in Research, the highest scientific distinction in Israel. Among her award-winning publications are Consuming the Romantic Utopia, Love and the Cultural Contradictions of Capitalism in 1997. Then in 2003, her book on Oprah Winfrey and the Glamour of Misery, an essay on popular culture and then a book which Johannes Kaup just mentioned, Why Love Hurts, a Sociological Explanation, originally published in German by Zorkamp under the title Warum Liebe Wehtut. I think we're going to hear a lecture today on why capitalism, or in ways in which capitalism erodes democracy, bringing together the two themes of social democracy, its decline in the last few years, the way in which our political processes are increasingly shaped by a financial oligarchy, the ways in which the cultural and ideological chasms between the creative classes and the working and lower middle classes have led to an erosion of former class solidarities and alliances, and the ways in which the devaluation of the working classes resulting from these developments has led to a swing to the far right. But what we're also going to hear are her thoughts on the question of the dissolution of personal relationships under capitalism, their instrumentalization, and their monetization, their commodification. And we are going to hear something on her new book, which is called Happycracy, how the industry of happiness controls our lives. A warm welcome to you, and thanks for being with us tonight.
Thank you very much, uh, Shalini, uh, for this introduction. Um, one of the advantages I found out of um, having uh, taken a very strong uh, painkillers is that it's so strong that um, it kills the pain and the anxiety of speaking in public, uh, which I normally have. I really want to thank uh, Professor Randeria for this uh, invitation. I've heard about this institute and yourself for a long time and um, never found the opportunity to come and I'm extremely pleased uh, to be here and honored as well. Um, I want to say that the lecture I will give you is not really typical for me, um, perhaps because of the venue, which is uh, uh, the radio, I did not think of this as a, uh, an academic lecture, uh, rather even though I'm going to deliver it as a lecture, it's uh, more some uh, personal thoughts. And these personal thoughts emerged from a sense of um, disarray, uh, my own, my personal disarray I was in <clears throat> because I count myself as having always been on what is roughly called the left or the liberal left or the camp of social democracy. And yet in the two places where I have been living, uh, both in France and in Israel, social democracy has, uh, or the left has, con have considerably um, uh, eroded. And so it, I'm going to share with you some uh, thoughts which, again, have not been written as an academic paper, which would have required from me a different exercise. Social democracy finds its source in two struggles. One against the exploitation of human labor and the other in the emancipation of disenfranchised groups and individuals. In American terms, the first would be identified with the socialist left and the second with the liberal left. The first emphasizes economic policies of redistribution and regulation of labor. The second struggles to enforce group and individual rights through courts and through the regulation of cultural representations. These two lefts need not be opposite, and we may view them very well as both being a part of social democracy. And yet the recent world wave of populist, xenophobic, conservative, authoritarian regimes has compelled many to wonder about the possibility of holding both lefts, both projects together, with many calling for discarding identity politics and returning to socialism. So is the left condemned to be a hydra, or with two heads, um, or can it unite its two heads into a plausible overall vision of the struggles to come? I ask the question, but I don't have an answer. Since the 1960s, the liberal left has successfully fought for minority rights, but it could not do this without neglecting what had been historically its vocation, namely the struggle against economic domination and inequality. And here I'm in agreement, for example, with many, but I think one of the first who made this case very powerfully was Richard Rorty in uh, achieving our country. This strategy was, the, the, the strategy of defending uh, minority rights was all the more hazardous, full of hazards, that from the 1980s onward, markets and market thinking started really invading all spheres of social life. This is the famous turn to neoliberalism from the mid-1980s. It was during that same period that the left, in most parts of the industrial West, started emphasizing cultural rights and sexual politics with the inevitable result that it neglected the struggle against class inequalities produced by capitalism itself. In other words, the shift away from 
politics of, of redistribution to recognition. And from a rhetoric that emphasized exploitation and class struggle occurred at the same time that capitalism was starting to actually reach into all the interstices of society and was slowly tearing apart the social fabric. There was actually more than one reason for the disaffection of the rhetoric of class struggle by the left. Identity politics and sexual equality, initially at least, did not sit well with, with materialist, conventionally materialist views of history and society. In fact, it was mostly the middle class women and homosexuals, middle or upper middle, class women and homosexuals who initially fought for equality because only those who were above subsistence level could notice that they were victims of non-economic forms of exclusion. And whereas if you want the poor were excluded in so many other ways, more perhaps primary ways that they could not initially be part of those sexual and, and gender struggles. The left abandoned the critique of capitalism for another reason. The very nature of capitalist domination became much more confused and muddled. In the 1970s, capitalism was no longer at all the brutal extraction of value realized in coal pits and high furnaces, although there remains obviously some brutal forms of exploitation, uh, look at Amazon, for example. But uh, capitalism became a highly sophisticated machine that had made work creative. It's really the 1970s and 80s is the rise of what's called the creative classes. And it tapped into the desires and aspirations of workers through now a very well-organized consumption and markets of consumption. Mass markets created broad inclusive frames which made the idea and rhetoric of class struggles seem outdated. More and more social groups could consume more and more goods. And this broad consumer frame resonated with the fact that the working classes could hope for social mobility and actually quite often achieved it, both for themselves and for their children. Um, so capitalism, if you want, changed, and in, in a way there was a kind of um, um, dissonance or lack of fit between the theories that seemed to exist, the Marxist theories that seemed to exist, and what was happening. There was a third reason for the disaffection of the, the rhetoric of class struggle. Throughout the 20th century, the media industries have been a phenomenal source of profit and a key impetus for capitalist development. But it was also the arena par excellence for the exercise of new liberal politics of representation. Under the impetus of postmodern and post-structuralist theories, equality became a matter of discourse, images, and stories. And this new politics of <clears throat> <clears throat> and the left, in fact, turned or redefined, if you want, its um, object of um, uh, critique and struggle and created a new politics of representation. This new politics of representation took place within the same industries which gave a formidable cultural power to capitalist lifestyles and to consumer ideology. Social movements and academic studies focused on the visual industries, on the media, as the arena for the transformation of images, stereotypes, and prejudices against minorities. I studied myself in the US in the mid-1980s, and in fact, um, the medias were really a big focus of, um, of 
you know, of uh, the studies in sociology, communications, and even literature, because these were thought to be now the repository of the uh, stigma and stereotypes against those minorities. But media industries were, ironically so, the source of new forms of extraction of surplus value. It was through media stories and images that consumer lifestyles became promoted worldwide, that brands were sold, and that identity was refashioned to become a matrix of taste and consumer choices. And it is through those same media that the liberal left increasingly expressed successfully its new politics of representation, promoting multiculturalist, feminist, pro-gay messages in movies and TV series. And we all know and see how much the content uh, of TV series and movies has changed. For example, making homosexuality a form, uh, completely normalizing homosexuality. I think media played a, a huge role in that. In reflecting the new politics of identity of the left, media neglected also to portray working class lives. Studies of media content in the USA have consistently found that 90% of media characters are middle or upper middle class, and only 10% are working classes, thus suggesting that the media have been the cultural arena par excellence for the expression of the middle and upper middle classes' worldviews, and that the working classes were, in fact, symbolically erased from them, um, unless they appeared in minor and um, derogatory roles. The final reason why the critique of capitalism declined was that various leaders of the left, what was called the left, Blair, Mitterrand, Clinton, and today Macron, increasingly espoused the view that there was no alternative to the market and implemented politics of, or policies of austerity and free trade, accepting implicitly the premises of free marketers that markets could not be surpassed. Thus, while capitalism was slowly corroding the life world, that is, the fabric of work, the family, locality, democracy, and solidarity, its deep transformative impact was no longer really intelligible. This is why I think the struggle to understand and contain capitalism remains, as in the 19th century, should remain the main goal of the left. And let me identify a few key issues in order to do that. It's not exhaustive, I'm sure there are many more but there was only so much I could uh, put in. The first issue is that capitalism, I think, has had a direct, not indirect, direct impact on uh, democracy and democratic participation. Democracy is best realized when the demos, the people, is represented and participates in decision-making. Until well into the 20th century, most Western countries were only imperfect or partial democracies. For example, women were granted the right to vote long or very long after men. But soon after a vote became universal, the capacity of the demos to shape political processes was considerably diminished by the increasing role played by capital, at least that's for sure true in the USA. Um, oligarchies and their representatives in the forms of bureaucratic experts started shaping state-level decision processes. And by the way, I refer you to a very interesting book that, um, called Democracy in Chains, which really traces back the ways in which in the 1950s already, with a Brown versus Board of Education decision, uh, there were um, um, very rich uh, people that allied themselves with economists, such as an economist named Buchanan, 
in order to defeat the, uh, what they saw as the worrisome democratization of uh, society. In this particular example, the desegregation of schools. And there have been also, I mean, the book documents also the ways in which they have been very successful. They've taken um, a, a strategy, a long-term strategy, and have been uh, successful 20 or 30 years down the road. So, if we wanted to count the uh, examples of the ways in which um, experts shape decisions, experts lobbyists, etc., shape state-level decision processes, you know, we can pick a lot of examples, such as tax cuts, which benefit the super-rich. Um, uh, and here, Clinton's capital gains tax, tax, cut, ca tax cuts, which swell the pockets of the 1%, or Macron's cancellation of tax on financial investments, we can think about the European stiff politics of austerity imposed on Greece. We can think about the deregulations of labor law in various countries, or the bailout of AIG company with taxpayers' money, the relative impunity of the financial brokers who caused the 2008 financial collapse, down to the enormous role which capital now plays in political machines through philanthropic foundations, lobbies, and pressure groups, think tanks, informal networks where business and political elites mix. And here also you probably all of you know the extraordinary role that the Koch brothers, um, David, David and Charles, uh, I think it's David or Frank, I don't remember, um, um, have played, have been, they have been become highly famous or infamous for literally hijacking politics in order to fight um, the government and f for opposing anything that would rein in and limit carbon emissions. So all of these point to financial oligarchy, capable, actually highly, highly capable, of shaping policy through organizations, bureaucracy, networks, and philanthropy. Moreover, we cannot underestimate the role which economists as a profession have played in using their scientific expertise to serve free market worldview and to serve actually sometimes quite directly this oligarchy, indirectly undermining not only democracy but also and perhaps more crucially, the belief in democracy. Exposing systematically the dispossession of democratic power by economic oligarchies and their experts should be, in my opinion, one of the first items on the agenda of the left to restore trust in the democratic process itself. The second major issue which the left should address is that of work. Traditional work has been actually, or is, running the risk of being destroyed by technology, downsizing, by the permanence obsolescence of skills, and by the delocalization of production. Some people estimate that part-time and precarious jobs will soon constitute 50% of all employment. The gig economy, along with the precarization of all forms of employment, the stagnation of salaries, the rising cost of education, the difficulty to achieve social mobility, and the prospect of technology of replacing human beings, all of these suggest that capitalism affects and erodes the quality of work, and the, in fact, the very capacity to work. Now, urban centers have experienced an economic and cultural renaissance in the last two decades, becoming key engines of wealth. And so while we've had that process, and it's one of the most, I think, interesting processes that, has, that have happened in the last 40 or 50 years 
which I think was not really theorized until recently, namely that cities, as cities, have been an enormous source of wealth. So in contrast, thank you so much, in contrast, exurbs, suburbs, countryside, and small-sized town have considerably degraded because they do not generate wealth or offer attractive work prospects. And in fact, Trumpism, Brexit, and les gilets jaunes are all expression of the economic dwindling of zones that are on the periphery of urban zones. It's quite easy to view these three phenomena also as expression of the urban exurbs or small town or countryside divide. The degradation experienced by these zones metastasis, met metastasis to other spheres of daily life, affecting marriage prospects and family stability, social mobility, and mostly a sense of trust in the future. This general degradation of working class lives is a fundamental element of the vast unrest and social malaise throughout Europe and the USA, a malaise which the extreme right has known how to capitalize on. Rehabilitating work in non-urban zones and repairing infrastructures and re revitalizing associative and democratic life in non-urban centers is thus, for me, a primary goal, should be a primary goal of the left. Three, the modes of capitalist accumulation of the post-1960s have considerably diminished the capacity of the left to form class alliances. Cities, so here I continue the same idea, but in a different direction. Cities and not industrial towns or agrarian lands are now a major source of wealth and constitute platforms for the circulation of capital. Cities are privileged sites for the flourishing of what Richard Florida has called the creative classes who live in large urban centers and constitute a large, or actually the largest segment of the liberal left and left-wing voters. Um, the creative class is made of people with a college degree people working in the media industries, in movies and TVs, in art and design, in advertising, in research and universities, in publishing and journalism, and at various other positions of the intellectual slash cultural labor process. The creative classes are the most likely to identify with and to move forward the uh, politics of identity um, of the post-1960s left. This has had an enormously important outcome, namely creating an abyssal cultural and ideological chasm between the creative classes and the working and lower middle classes. This is really, I think, quite new. It's something of the last 30 years. And we know in America, for example, that people who voted for the Republican or Democrats um, were far less, um, it was far less dichotomized. Um, and that um, many, you could, it was much less easy to predict uh, what you would vote for based on where you lived in or based on your profession. Traditional socialism represented the working classes and the lower segments of the petite bourgeoisie and frequently included the intellectuals who functioned as a vanguard for the working classes. The ethos and values of these intellectuals overlapped with that of the working classes. For example, belief in thrift, in family, in collective bargaining, in universalism, in progress. Intellectuals traditionally constituted bridges between the working classes and the upper middle classes. Think of Sartre, Sartre would have been the paradigmatic example. Since the 1980s, however, these alliances have come undone, mostly because the creative classes, which work from within the belly of capitalist cultural and visual industries, have made alliances with 
LGBTQ, and ethnic, racial, gender, and, religi and religious, sometimes, minorities, and developed, as a result, value systems very different from those of the working classes. The main ethos of the creative classes is what I would call individual or, and sexual expressivity, tolerance for all forms of life, cultural relativism, and, and cosmopolitanism. In fact, um, you know, a scholar, a British scholar, views cosmopolitanism really as a, a crucial dimension, as having played a crucial dimension in Brexit, for example, and he builds a distinction between what he calls those who are of everywhere and those who are of just one place. And of course, those who are of one place are the Brexiters and um, those who opposed um, the Brexit, those in the re Remain camp, he says, are much more likely to be cosmopolitans and to view themselves as of being of many different places. So these, uh, this is very much an ethos that belongs to the creative classes. To be sure, I want to be clear, the struggles for women and LGBTQ rights were and remain absolutely crucial for the democratization of our societies and for the emancipation of groups that have been and continue to be generally oppressed. But we can only observe that by and large, the working and the lower middle classes have not joined these struggles, and, um, and these struggles have remained, and painfully so, the appanage of the educated and the urban, generating then deep class divisions that are not only material, but also symbolic and cultural. For the working and lower middle classes, the, tradi the, the, the family, the traditional family, has remained a key value and source of social solidarity and mutual help, while expressive individualism is the main ethos of the creative classes. Expressive individualism finds its um, expression in the construction, for example, of new family forms, in challenging gender roles and identities, and in questioning Christian and white and Western identity. In contrast, the emphasis on religious tradition, on territory, on the white nation, and on the traditional family. Uh, this is true in the US, and this, this is true in France as well, by the way. Um, is located on the other side of an abyss that has opened between two competing political and moral views. So these political views um, go really much deeper. This is what, what really I want to say. They go much deeper than a simple question of politics. You know, in the 1950s, I think it was more a question of politics. You. Um, but now I think they engage entire moral perspectives, raising the stakes of political opinions and making these political opinions much more fundamental to one's identity and in fact far less tract tractable because they engage the self and the moral values that are deep to the self themselves. And, um, the New York Times two years ago ran a big story, I think it was around Thanksgiving, about the phenomenon apparently quite, uh, that became quite widespread of entire families that broke apart because some had voted for Trump and others simply could not stand it. And um, so that's an illustration of what I'm talking about. The deep cultural alienation between the working and creative classes around key topics as sexuality, the family, religion, immigration, and nationalism, is thus both material and symbolic, and has morphed into a struggle about morality itself. In parallel to this moral chasm, the creative classes became increasingly perceived as illegitimate elites because they not only have they enjoyed an accumulation of wealth accrued by cities, 
but also because they have enjoyed of the symbolic power of the creative industry. Um, so, and by the way, um, those of you who have heard of Ali Hochschild, the sociologist, she wrote a beautiful book called Strangers in Their Own Land. This is, I think, exactly what she finds. She finds that um, people who live in Louisiana, for example, perceive um, the uh, members of minorities as having illegitimately benefited from the help of the liberal elites, um, whereas they have been stuck. So, to be sure, the creative classes have attracted far more attention and have been far more the object of resentment than the Wall Street and corporate oligarchs who have actually been quietly amassing unprecedented levels of wealth. Um, Bezos and Gates each have more than $100 billion. And have been undermining democratic processes. The result is clear. Former class alliances between the working, the middle, and the, and the middle classes and the intellectuals are no longer possible because the moral chasm between these social groups is too large. And this is the, this fact that has been readily capitalized on by the likes of Stephen Bannon, Marine Le Pen, or Salvini, who can plausibly claim to represent the moral views of the people. This is why people who do not stand for sexual morality or purity as Donald Trump, uh, Marine Le Pen, or Salvini, in fact can create alliances between workers, religious traditionalist people, and free marketers, liberals. So they've been much better, in other words, at creating these class, uh, unexpected class alliances. To say this differently, Working classes have been devalued materially by the precarization of work, the stagnation of salaries, the decay of neighborhoods, and by delocalization of work, but they have also been devalued symbolically because they did not join the moral identity of the urban liberal creative classes. Now just remember, not so long ago there was really a mystique of the working class, I think definitely up until the 1960s and the 1970s, at least in France, there was a mystique of the working class. The working class is today quite often derided by, as rednecks. And so, so, uh, so what I want to say is that the working classes did not join the, this moral identity of the creative classes and could not participate in the politics of recognition of minority groups because I believe they themselves were increasingly denied that recognition. In an important study of German and French voters of, for the extreme right, the researchers suggest that voters of the extreme right have not necessarily adopted right-wing narratives but rather that they explain their political allegiance to the far right in terms of their own feeling, their own sentiment of devaluation. So material and symbolic devaluation fuels the perception that no one cares and hence feeds resentment directed at the groups who seem to be cared for, that is women, ethnic or religious minorities, and sexual minorities. Of course, this is false consciousness, uh, as Arlie Hochschild shows in, uh, in her book, but still it's a very powerful sentiment. So I think that the left must reckon with the fact that for many members of the working classes, transgender bathrooms or norms of gender neutral speech do not constitute any significant improvement of their own life. And it's not an issue that they really identify with. So one important objective of the left should be to address the systematic neglect and devaluation of working class lives within the left itself. 
To accomplish this, the liberal left must move away from an us versus them mindset. Uh, of course, they're not the only one who have this mindset that pervades many urban liberal groups. It should address the causes and pathological expressions of the malaise that affects the working classes with the cold scalpel of the surgeon and the empathy of the nurse. And for me, an example of someone who did that is Didier Eribon return to Reims, who did exactly that, who I think in this very beautiful book, Eribon analyzed extremely well um, the reason why the working class that he knows intimately moved to uh, Le Pen and to the extreme right. We need more analysis and types of understanding of that sort. So this means, this means actually engaging with bigotry and racism in the same way as Eribon does, that is, both as insiders and outsiders. Blanket condemnations of racism, I think, will not do. These blanket condemnations cannot substitute for an understanding of what racism stands for, sometimes for some groups. And I think we should, in particular, try to see if perhaps we can separate in racism, in xenophobia, we could separate different forms and expressions of it. For example, the uh, theory um, of uh, hierarchy of human beings, which is, by the way, more present, I think, among the elites. And what in racism is more simply either resentment or fear or aspiration for pride. However abhorrent racism is, it should, we should try to undo what in it is about organizing out-group, in-group boundaries, projecting on others one's fears, and restoring pride in one's own group. Bridging the cultural chasm between the creative classes and the working classes, I think, will be done by exiting what I would call the splendid moral Olympian position of the left, and by reflecting and, and by engaging, if you want, in a more direct dialogue with um, the source of malaise of the working class people, a dialogue of the kind that Didier Ribot again engaged in. Um, maybe, you know, my last point will have to do with immigration, and I will go uh, quickly. I think that a left view of immigration should oppose ultranationalistic reactions, um, but it should also examine the ways in which immigration flows are connected quite often to globalization of capitalist processes of production. So I think that um, a great deal of immigration um, and this is not me saying, uh, researchers have um, established this, a great deal of uh, 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 immigration profits actually the richest people and creates intense competitiveness at the bottom of society and creates lines of fractures precisely at the bottom of societies. Now, this is something we should, uh, uh, and by the way, there is a tradition within Marxist uh, 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 theory in Marxist left. There is a tradition which I do not subscribe to, uh, don't misunderstand me, but this tradition opposes, one tradition opposes immigration precisely on the, um, uh, along the lines that immigrants uh, actually tend to bring down salaries. They, uh, and so my only point here is that the issue of immigration is not going to go away and will continue to be a deeply divisive issue in, uh, Western, in Western democratic societies. And I think uh, sometimes I've, I see the left as tiptoeing around this issue and avoiding it as if it was a taboo. I think this issue should be addressed uh, head on. And in particular, as I put it, the issue of um, you know, what uh, it does to the working classes to the bottom rungs of society should be really um, addressed. 
This is uh, all the more the case that, again, the um, upper middle class, uh, which, or the middle class, some of sections of the middle class which used to be nationalistic have become actually internationalist. So again, this is the same division that I mentioned before between those who are of somewhere and those who are of everywhere. Nationalism, it, I, and here I rejoin the opinion of Yasha Munk, nationalism need not be exclusive. It can be if it's worked on uh, well, it can be ex inclusive, that is, devoid of racism and xenophobia, and can inquire more directly and less timidly about the question of how borders and immigration should be um, uh, organized. As in the 19th century, capitalism should remain the focus of the left, while during the 19th century it was easy to identify capitalism in the inhumane treatment of workers that Engels described in Manchester, it is today far more difficult to connect directly the unease, insecurity, and tensions that plague the lives of victims of capitalism. The intelligibility of the chains of causality have broken down. This is why liberal free marketer, con marketers, conservatives, and far writers can eke, eat the cake and have it too. The liberal free marketers promote ruthless economic policies which drive down jobs and disempower the working classes, but the deep social malaise which their own economic policies entail can be harvested by the far right wing. This is, by the way, not true of all countries. Uh, for example, Poland has been economically flourishing and also uh, has become more, uh, uh, much more populist than right wing. So it's not true of all countries. We, must, we may thus wonder if left wing populism I don't know, but I'm raising this as a possibility. Um, that left-wing populism is the antidote to right-wing populism. Populism should not be a long-term strategy, but it can be a short-term response to the current crisis of democracy and, its high, high, and the fact that it has been hijacked by populist parties. By left-wing populism, I mean a strategy that does not hesitate to expose the true enemies of the demos of the people, namely the class of experts and corporate oligarchs that have directly attacked democratic forms of participation. I also mean a mode of political recruitment that addresses and understand small ordinary people in their concrete and daily experiences and st struggles that, and that tries to overcome the urban and non-urban divide and the chasm between their moral views. And finally, by left-wing populism, I mean, um, I mean perhaps a use uh, or giving up maybe um, a moral um, a sense of moral purity, uh, the striving for moral purity in politics, and preferring to understand what motivates popular resentment, fear, or even hatred, rather than addressing these with moral disgust. I think it is incumbent on the left to overcome um, moral tribalism um, that has increasingly constituted the core of contemporary politics. Thank you. A sick man now talks with a rising woman, which you, you didn't feel very sick no. on, on the stage. No, we were very in your element. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Ähm, wir kommen von den großen, äh, vom großen Systemen zu den kleinen Lebenswelten. Also wir haben ein bisschen einen anderen Fokus unseres Gesprächs. Ironischerweise baut der ökonomische Erfolg des liberalen Kapitalismus auf moralischen Werten auf, die er definitiv nicht selbst geschaffen hat. Ehrlichkeit, Gerechtigkeit, Solidarität, Mitgefühl. Diese Werte borgt sich der Kapitalismus von den täglich gelebten Überzeugungen einer Gesellschaft und diese sind ihrerseits wieder Erbe von humanistischen, religiösen, ethischen Überzeugungen. Ohne diese Werte würde der Kapitalismus die demokratische Gesellschaft zerstören, den ökologischen Lebensraum zerstören und wegen seiner Exzesse letztlich auch sich selbst. Also aus Gründen des Überlebens und der Überlebensfähigkeit der Generationengerechtigkeit stehen wir heute vor der dringenden Aufgabe, den nachahmenden Zwang des Konsumierens irgendwie zu zähmen. Ohne dass man den Kapitalismus jetzt generell dämonisiert, Eva Illus, sehen Sie die Möglichkeit, den Einfluss des Kapitalismus und die Vermarktlichung aller sozialen Lebensbereiche wie Familie, Erziehung, Liebesbeziehungen und Demokratie zu beschränken oder zurückzudrängen? I put it in English, okay? I think it's better. Okay. Yeah. Ironically, the success of neoliberal capitalism depends upon moral values that are definitely not generated by capitalism, such as honesty, justice, solidarity, and compassion. Values like these are borrowed from lived daily convictions in the society that stem from its uh, humanitarian, religious, and ethical legacy. Without such values, capitalism would destruct the democratic society, the ecological habitat, and even self-destruct Uh, through its own excesses. So we have to uh, tame uh, capitalism and to tame the urge to consume also. Yeah? And without demonizing capitalism as a system uh, in general, as a wealth generating motor, I would like to ask, um, do you see possibilities of restricting capitalist influence and thought of marketization in the societal spheres like family, like education, human relationships and democracy. If I see a possibility of rest restricting capitalism into these spheres, um, I mean, you know, uh, if, if you decide to restrict, you can, of course, restrict. But let me just, I mean, before I address this issue, um, if anything, uh, things seem to be going out of control, if anything. I mean, take a phenomenon like Amazon. We can ask a question of how, as to what is the relationship between Amazon and the kind of society that Adam Smith had envisioned. So if Adam Smith is one example of, um, of a capitalist, of a market society, so for Adam Smith, you're right, for Adam Smith, um, market behavior is a virtuous behavior. There was no question that um, economic behavior was connected to, uh, to virtues. But more crucially, uh, competition, for example, was uh, crucial to that worldview. Um, we don't live in a world where there is any more competition. Again, look at Amazon. I think Amazon should profoundly worry us because Amazon practices um, is, practi is taking us in a way both forward and backward. Um, Amazon workers cannot be unionized. Uh, Amazon, uh, an Amazon worker um, suffers um, physical injuries, is much more likely to suffer, is twice more likely to suffer physical injuries than a worker in any other uh, uh, line of work. Uh, an Amazon worker not only, uh, I mean, has to scan one item every 11 seconds. And if this is not the pace of the worker, then Amazon knows. Amazon knows you have not uh, observed this quota that Amazon has decided for you. 
And Amazon has today the wealth of a state. Uh, it, it's not a corporation. It is actually a transnational uh, entity. It's uh, between a state and a corporation. I'm not exactly sure what it is. So, so a lot of the, um, if you want, the, 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 the collective compromises that workers and capitalists made throughout the 19th and 20th century are collapsing under such forces are, as Amazon. And so, um, so and, but Amazon, so to go back to your question, and yet what the consumer experiences is the marvelous magic of uh, pushing a, a button, not knowing, and, and seeing the product uh, um, at your doorstep. Not knowing that for this magic to happen, uh, you actually have to uh, make people work in absolutely horrendous conditions. Um, so, so, if anything, I think uh, what we are seeing is an accentuation of an, an extremization of a logic which for a while seemed to be more under uh, control. Um, so how do you stop this logic? I'm not exactly sure. I think right now people are very uh, uh, worried, and they should be, because uh, the, uh, the ways in which um, workers fought traditionally capital was within the frameworks of the nation state. Mm. Uh, but here, yeah, Amazon is not really located within uh, the framework of a, of a nation state, so it's not really clear how you do it. Um, so it's a personal, just a personal task. It's a practice, uh, a personal task. Um, here, not to invest, or not to be involved. So, back to go. Um, so, it's a personal decision to go out of this consumeristic model, like Amazon. Is that what you want to say? Well, you know, I think. Um, green politics and ecology is increasingly making us aware of the results of these uh, patterns of consumption. But, and yet, if you look at the uh, power of Amazon, it, you cannot explain that power um, if, you, if there was a real um, reduction in patterns of consumption. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we are still very far uh, I think the, the state will probably have to intervene. I think this is what, I mean, if you, private, if you leave consumption, um, if, you, if you keep it as a private practice, which it is today, um, it will be very difficult to rein in. Mm -hmm. um, um, private consumers will not limit themselves mm -hmm. to certain products. This is why, you know, perhaps the, the state, again the state, will have to uh, intervene and make, I don't know, regulations, for example, about travels. Maybe the, the day is not very far where we will be allowed to travel only four times a year. Mm. Um, I don't, yeah. In Ihrem Buch, Warum Liebe endet, zeigen Sie die wechselseitige Durchdringung von Kapitalismus, Sexualität, Geschlechterverhältnis und Technologie. Äh, Sie zeigen, wie das eine neue Form von Sozialität hervorbringt. Sie sprechen von einer Soziologie negativer Beziehungen. Man kann auch in diesem Zusammenhang von einer Kultur der Lieblosigkeit sprechen. Um ein erstes Gefühl dafür zu bekommen, welche Phänomene meinen Sie denn da konkret? In Ihrem Buch, Warum Liebe endet, uh, Wild of Ends, you analyze how the mutual fusion of capitalism, sex, gender, re gender relations and technology leads to a new form of sociality. You speak of a sociology of negative relation. One could also say it's a culture of unkindness. To get a first taste of it, which phenomena are you referring to? <laughs> culture of unkindness, that's nice. Um, well, okay, so I, I coined the term negative relations to speak about um, what I think is now a dominant form of sociality, which is the fact that a lot of relationships 
do not really form or do not gel into a concrete relationship. Um, so it's a property of hyperconnectedness, if you want. One is, it's a proper property of hyperconnected uh, sociality, where uh, we meet uh, lots of people, and in meeting uh, lots of people, we also unmeet a lot of people. Um, so that's one aspect of what I call a negative relationship. Another aspect of negative relationship that I put in it is this idea that um, we approach some relationships, sexual romantic relationships, um, with indeterminacy. We do not know exactly what are the rules to conduct these relationships. We, um, and that is very specific and among others, this is what I show in the book. It is that contrary to most relationships which have become quite highly codified, sexual and romantic relationships have become highly uncodified. Uncodified, so the rules of engagement and the rules to behave in them have become very ambiguous and uncertain. So it's about indeterminateness and uncertainty and the role of uncertainty. And the third meaning of negative relationships is a mean is the you know the Heideggerian meaning of things breaking down. So Heidegger says it takes the metaphor of um, you having a hammer in your hand you're, and you're hammering, but he says if your hammer breaks down, then you will start paying attention to what you're doing. A second ago, you were not thinking about it. Um, you know, I was not thinking about my body yesterday. And as soon as I got sick, I really, the mm. only thing I could think about was that. And so it's, it's the same with negative relationships. Because so much in them breaks down, then you are forced to pay attention to them and to constantly manage them reflexively. They become this object of reflexive monitoring. That's also an aspect of negativity. So negativity is used in a philosophical sense and not in the ordinary sense of that which is opposed to positive. Um die Geschichte zu verstehen, wie es dazu kam, in der vormodernen Gesellschaft gab es vor allem pragmatische Gründe, eine Ehe einzugehen. Heute in Zeiten der Selbstversorgung der Frauen dominiert das Ideal der romantischen Liebe. Sie sagen nun, die Menschen in unserer westlichen Kultur haben sich, wenn sie vor die Wahl zwischen Bindung und Freiheit gestellt sind, sich tendenziell auf die Seite der Freiheit geschlagen. Warum ist das so gekommen? In pre-modern pre -modern societies, one had pragmatical reasons to form lifelong relationships, like marriage, yeah? Today, in times of female self-sufficiency, the ideal of romantic love is predominant. You say that most people in Western societies have, in the choice between relation and liberty, uh, generally speaking, opted for liberty. Yeah? Uh, why has this come about? I, I, I think that freedom is um, really the trump value of modern people. I think, um, I don't know, if we go back to capitalism, capitalism, the ultimate justification for capitalism was um, the freedom of goods and the freedom of owners and the freedom of laborers. Um, if you look at uh, the struggles um, the, for democratization of society, most of them, not all of them, but most of them have been about freedom. Freedom to be who you are. Uh, and demand from, the society, from society to help you achieve whatever you choose to be. So, um, you, so if you look at the artistic, the art worlds, art worlds, the modern art world um, defines itself practically by its capacity to implement the freedom to imagine alternative ways of being. 
um, freedom of expression is absolutely central to culture, to our modern culture. It was not 200 years ago. Um, and of course, freedom um, was also implemented very much in the realm of personal relationships. Hegel, who is the great philosopher of freedom, thought that marriage uh, ought to also reflect uh, freedom by being a marriage of love. For him, love was the expression of the freedom of uh, the individual. So I want to say that, you know, however, wherever you look at, you know, in all social spheres, I would say that freedom is the paramount um, value that is affirmed, whether in economics, whether in politics, whether in uh, culture, and whether in sexuality. Mit der Möglichkeit, einen Partner zu wählen, also in der romantischen Liebesbeziehung, kam aber auch die Möglichkeit, einen Partner abzuwählen, ja? also sich von ihm zu trennen oder ihr zu trennen. Zu 70 Prozent sind es im Schnitt die Frauen, die Männer abwählen. Sie haben da mehrere Gründe ausgemacht, warum es zu diesen Trennungen kommt. Können Sie uns da ein bisschen mehr dazu erzählen? With the free possibility of freely choosing a partner came also the possibility of deselect a partner, yeah? uh, to end a relationship, to divorce. Yeah? More than 70% of the actors are women. Yeah? In your book, you see main reasons for this separation. Could you give us some more details about that? About what? About these, the reasons of, for, for the separation, why women... Oh, okay. Uh, well, in, in the book, um, so the book, um, there are a few threads running through it, but and one of them is to, sh to claim that um, the reasons why people don't um, get together or the reason why relationships evaporate very quickly because that's one of the things that interested me very much, how come, what, what makes people um, uh, disappear after one or two encounters. So some of the reasons why it happens in those preliminary stages happen, are some of these social forces are at work as well uh, during marriage or when people divorce. And I was interested in these two cases because Two cases are different forms of what I call in the book un unchoosing. So the freedom of choice was really central to the uh, modern struggle of love. You know, um, love was a modern value because individuals sh had to be free to choose, and now they have to be free to unchoose. And um, so one of the one uh, one of the forces that interests me there is the status of sexuality. How people uh, the role of sexuality in um, um, making people meet and unmeet, and actu and actually sexuality plays it. It uh, turns out also a significant role in the reasons why people will divorce. They will translate their um, desire to stop being together. They will say, most of my interviewees, but that is backed up also by research, will say that stopping to have sexual relationships is what uh, gave them the understanding that they should stop the relationship. Now. The reason why sexuality has come to have such, um, I would say, um, such, I mean, it has come to define really the entire ontology of relationships has to do, this is also an argument of the book, has to do with the ways in which sexuality has played into an enormous amount of capitalist industries. So that sexuality is one of the chief um, commodities of, uh, of the, you know, invented by the 20th century. We are sold our own sexuality. 
um, our own sexual body. Uh, so I cannot get, I'm not going to get here into the details of the analysis, but this is basically the crux of the argument, is how much sexuality has become a key mediation in our relationship to another, and contrary to the view that sexuality is what is primary in us, I claim on the, quite the contrary, that sexuality is highly, highly mediated through, industry, through a variety of industries. Mm. You, also, Sie beschäftigen sich immer mit dem Phänomen des Speed Datings, Gelegenheitssex, Cybersex, Robotern als Sexspielzeuge, der Pornofizierung der Gesellschaft. Ja. Was zeigt sich in diesen konsumkapitalistischen Formen des Gefühls- und Liebeslebens? You've written about several phenomena like speed dating, casual sex, cybersex, robots as sex toys, and the general pornification of the society. What do these consumeristic capitalist forms of em emotional and sexual life show us? Yeah. Um. I think what they show us is that um, the reason why capitalism has become this highly efficient economic form that reaches out actually in um, all of the rest of society, it's not, capitalism is no longer an economic system. It is really much more. It is a social system and actually organizes all spheres of life. And what it shows is that it has done that extremely efficiently because it has addressed us in our subjectivity. And I, as I said just two minutes ago, it is reselling us our own subjectivity, repackaging for us our own subjectivity. This is what is common, I think, to the examples uh, you gave. So when sexuality, for example, you know, to have an, a, a sexual, to be sexy, think about this very simple sentence that all of us say or think. Uh, oh, she's very sexy, or he's such a sexy guy. Well, to, to be sexy today would require Uh, first of all, most likely it would require for you to work on your body, so to take a subscription to a gym. It would require from you to buy a wide array of cosmetics. It would require for you, from you to be up to date as to the latest uh, fashion. It would require from you at a certain age probably to do some cosmetic surgery or to have some cosmetic uh, intervention. So. When we say that we are exploring or, uh, our sexuality, what we are actually doing is shaping a product through a variety of industries. And I did not even mention the amount of psychologists and sex guides that some of us consume in order to know, you know how to be, or, or um, columns in women magazines, in order to know how to, um, I don't know, you know, how to, how, uh, nine best ways to give her an orgasm. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and so that also is, uh, mm -hmm. so, so, so capitalism after the 1970s, this is, I think, a remark that Wolfgang Streck uh, makes somewhere. Um, in around the 1970s, the market of solid goods becomes saturated, there is only so many cars or refrigerators you can sell. And, and the great discovery of that period is the self, not only for the hippies, but mostly for the industries. So you Because speak, the self is an endless commodity, actually. You speak about emodity, Sie sprechen von einem emodity, also eine Verbindung zwischen Waren und Emotionen, nicht einer? Ja, ja. Yeah, thank you for um, for mentioning that. Yeah, so an emodity, which is a composite word of uh, emotion and commodity, is a type of commodity which I think has not been adequately grasped by sociologists of emotions, and it is the fact that many commodities are increasingly produced not as not for the emotions they produce, but as an emotion. So, um, for example, Thomas Edison in, in the early 1910s 
already has this idea of classifying music according to the different moods that the music um, creates, you know, joyfulness, uh, sadness, and so on and so forth. So he took names of emotions to actually uh, package uh, music. The, the project was shelved, but this, is, this was an emodity. In, uh, uh, and emodity means, for example, in the case of music, that it's no longer the composer that is important, it's no longer the type of music, it's the mo mood. And you have uh, uh, scholars, researchers of Spotify that show that users actually classify their music on Spotify according to the mood that the music uh, produces. Um, take a Club Med, the uh, creation of the Club Med. I suppose all of you know what the Club Med is. With the Club Med, it's interesting that the Club Med in the 1950s um, came up with this idea of selling, promoting a notion that was new, that, was, uh, that emerged in the 19th century, among 19th century doctors, and it is this idea of relaxation. Relaxation was an idea that was made up by doctors to send uh, patients that were too stressed by urban life. Um, and then this notion that existed in the medical arena gets recuperated by the tourist industries. And so what the Club Med is about is creating an environment which is able to induce the, uh, in, a, in a kind of continuous way, the emotion or sensation of relaxation. Mm. And so on the basis of these examples, I identify, there are at least three, but there are much more uh, categories of emodities, which is uh, um, these, um, these commodities that produce um, emotions. Sie haben vorhin in Ihrem Vortrag von der Entwertung schon mal gesprochen, Devaluation, die Entwertung äh, des Arbeiters. Und das betrifft ja auch sozusagen das Liebesleben, die Liebesbeziehungen, ähm, genauer die Bewertung des Körpers bzw. die Abwertung des jeweiligen anderen Körpers. Which role does evaluation of the body play in modern love relationships? The sexual devaluation of the body of the other. Can you repeat? I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, which role plays the sexual devaluation of the body of the other? Yeah, because you uh, you had it also in your speech, but in other context. Yeah, the devaluation. I think um, you refer to the fact that in the book uh, Why Love Ends. Um, <clears throat> one question that um, perplexes me and other scholars is the fact that uh, at the same time that women make inroads in the workplace and um, seemingly acquire equality in front of the law, become highly devalued in the sexual sphere. Um, and one of the ways in which, or mechanisms in which they become devalued is through their sexuality. Um, um, and sexuality, the sexuality of women, their sexual body, has become actually for me a unit that has been considerably exploited by uh, media or, vi or what I call the visual industries. Um, and it has produced an enormous plus value uh, for these uh, industries. Um, and the fact that women have become redefined by their sexuality is one of the mechanisms through which they are devalued, period. That's why I think Catherine McKinnon uh, was the, the feminist, the feminist scholar Catherine McKinnon was absolutely right. Um, I mean, Catherine McKinnon was, 
highly controversial and many people thought that her um, claim that sexuality was the place where power, male power was exerted, they thought many people think it is a Puritan uh, way to deny sexuality. I, I think it's completely wrong and that she was completely right. But women have been and continue to be mostly today dominated through sexuality and so through sexuality, through the sexual body, their sexual body, women are devalued, which of course doesn't say anything about sexuality itself as a worthy or, or unworthy practice. Mm. Es ist viel über den Prozess des sich Verliebens geschrieben worden, davon ist die Literatur voll, aber wenige nur beschreiben das Phänomen des Entliebens, also das Phänomen, das uns ein Mensch ganz früher in helle Begeisterung versetzt hat, uns gleichgültig wird und wir uns von ihm distanzieren, weil die Liebe endet. Wie kommt es denn zu dieser Dynamik? In former times, until now, books were full of the pro process how to fall in love, yeah? but very few, like you, are writing about the end of love, about the demystification of the other, who once was the reason for our enchantment. Yeah? How does this dynamic work? Which dynamic? The dynamic of uh, disenchantment, of that, that we um, demystify the other, that, we, it, that it is not longer attracting to us. Um, so in the chapter on uh, divorce, I, um, I, I find there are three types of stories that people tell. Um, I, I don't know if that's the dynamic. It's, I don't think it's the dynamic. I would not call that the dynamic. But I would say this is the stories that people tell. One type of story is the story of um, epiphany, the, what I call the story of epiphany, which is that suddenly I understand. Burton Russell, for example, writes that he was riding his bike, and suddenly, while riding his bike, he realized he no longer loved his wife, Alice. So, um, But that's the story he tells. Yeah, that's the story the, he, he tells, exactly. Because I don't think that yeah, he will, exactly. by riding, uh, not <laughs> love, love so her, his a wife. A second story that people, <coughs> people tell is the story of accumulation. Mm -hmm. um, it was, it, it, it's, like a, it's like a fabric that slowly um, starts uh, tearing apart and then at some point the tear is too wide for us to ignore it and so it's the accumulation of indignities or conflict uh, etc. And the third story which for me is maybe the most interesting is the story that takes the form of a trauma uh, namely the other person does something that I can, in fact, never get over with. I can never really properly forgive. And so it's a trauma in the sense that it's a rupture into the set of assumption and trust I had in the other. And when that ruptures, I can never quite go back to what was before. And um, it turns out that people can um, um, carry that trauma with them for a very long time and at some point then decide to act on it and say, you know, actually, 10 years ago, you did not come to uh, help me at the hospital when I was there and I've been carrying this around for 10 years and now this is the reason why I'm leaving you. So... The so, so that's not a mechanism of disenchantment, but that's the, um, the stories, different forms of stories that people tell for how they become disenchanted with their um, partner. Mm. But the dream of relation, of uh, it may be lifelong relation, stays. Also, also der Traum einer lang andauernden Beziehungen bleibt aber nach wie vor präsent. The dream, the dream of a long-lasting long relation is still present with the people. 
Well, I think the... Um, Although uh, the reality is, has become complex and insecure. I think, you know, I think that romantic love and family and connectedness um, is extremely interesting for sociologists because um, you have ma very many different layers. You have one layer of, of, it's not traditional, by the way, I think it's very modern, this idea of a strong emotional bond that will carry you throughout your life is quite modern. Um, I wouldn't date it much, much before the 18th or 19th century. Um, at the same time, there are a lot of forces that undermine that kind of cultural fantasy and cultural model. Uh, economic forces, political forces, for example, feminism, or um, uh, homosexuality, which uh, completely transform our conception of the family. So, um, so it is, I think, the reason why, uh, for me, romantic love and the family are so interesting sociologically, it is because th this is where is concentrated, are concentrated all the contradictions of uh, modern social processes. Mm. Ich möchte Ihnen noch drei Fragen stellen zum Glück. Und zum Glück ist I want to put three more questions for, for your, your latest book, uh, Happy Crazy, <lacht> Dictate of Happiness. Uh, Thomas Jefferson schrieb in der Unabhängigkeitserklärung der Vereinigten Staaten, dass es Staatsziel sei, dass Menschen, also den Menschen Leben, Freiheit und das Streben nach Glück zu ermöglichen. Das Streben nach Glück wird als eine allgemeine Wahrheit beschrieben und deshalb muss der Staat den Rahmen für das zu erstrebende Glück bieten. Also was vor fast 250 Jahren ein Rahmen für die persönliche Wahl war, ist heute zu einem Zwang geworden. Was hat dieser Glückszwang Ihrer Meinung nach zu tun mit dem Wiederaufleben des Individualismus im Kapitalismus? Thomas Jefferson wrote in the United States Declaration of Independence the goals of the new state to guarantee life, freedom, and the pursuit of happiness. Pursuit of happiness is declared as a self-evident truth. Therefore, it is the duty of the state to provide the framework for this pursuitable happiness. What almost 250 years ago seemed to be a promise, a framework for own choice, has now become a duty, yeah? even more a compulsion, a constraint. What has this concept of, of compulsory happiness to do with the revival of individualism uh, under capitalist rule? Um, so I refer in the book uh, that you mentioned, I refer mostly to a field that is called happiness studies. So it's a, it's a book in actually the sociology of science in a way because it's a field that is approximately 15, 20 years old. It, oh, it was, um, and it's a group of cognitive psychologists who established this field. But the, uh, what makes this story, the story of this field so interesting is that this group of cognitive psychologists paired up with economists, prominent economists, and they were able to actually uh, shape um, or reshape public policy. For example, in, I'm sure all of you have heard of uh, happiness indexes. Uh, so they've been able to reshape uh, uh, policy in putting happiness on the agenda um, and in uh, measuring actually how well a country is doing um, by measuring the level of happiness of their citizens. So uh, one of the countries in which I live, which is Israel, has an ongoing occupation, uh, has one of the highest level of inequality in the world, um, has um, adult males uh, serve periodically in the army until the age of 50, uh, be highly uh, over indebted, etc. 
But the Israelis um, rank very high mm. in the uh, happiness index. They are very, high, very happy people, they seem mm. to be. So what is the conclusion? And actually Netanyahu was quick to take this to its natural and logical conclusion. We are doing great. We are doing great. Um, so no wonder that happiness indexes have been introduced in uh, places like uh, Qatar, um, you, places where there, is, there are no human rights at all. But as long as you can show for the happiness of your citizens, uh, you're doing well. So really what this book is about, it is about this um, uh, extraordinary success of a group of social scientists mm -hmm. in uh, reshaping the, uh, how um, government um, measure themselves and provide new standards for legitimacy, uh, thus obfuscating traditional measures of uh, policy making. But not only that, within uh, America, within European democratic countries, these same happiness uh, researchers, um, uh, have trouble calling them researchers, but um, have also come up with the idea that um, inequality is actually good because it instills what they call the hope factor. Um, and e equality is bad, but inequality is good because it makes you more, uh, it, it makes you more strive. Mm. Uh, it also uh, in, um, um, established programs in the army. The American army gave uh, several hundreds of millions of dollars, which is in the social sciences, I think, unheard of. Uh, to establish a, a, a program to grow out of trauma. So one of the insights of this research is um, that we, we can grow out of tra being traumatized. So, you know, I was raped, but hey, I can grow from it. Mm. Um, I was in the army and I killed or some one of my friends was killed, it was a trauma, but I can, I can grow from it. And how can I grow? By uh, developing skills of resilience. Mm. So, it is, so it's really a new science which is trying to um, not only provide skills to resist, to better resist all the indignities uh, that society or institutions inflict on us, but it is really about making it illegitimate to um, to be uh, to be wounded by by these institutions. Martin Seligman, einer der bekanntesten Vertreter der positiven Psychologie in den USA, glaubt, die Glücksformel gefunden zu haben. 90 Prozent des Glücks, ihres Glücks, hängen von ihren persönlichen Faktoren ab. Nur 10 Prozent von externen Faktoren, also wo sie geboren sind, wie sie aufgewachsen sind. Uh, wie viel Geld sie zur Verfügung haben, das ist so angeblich nur 10 Prozent, völlig uninteressant. Wenn aber Glück messbar geworden ist, dann wird es auch zu einer persönlichen Aufgabe, ja? ein Schulfach, ja? ein soziales Ziel, uh, weil, pädagogisch, äh, weil Glück pädagogisch produzierbar und selbst managebar uh, angesehen wird. Ja? Und das wird ja für viele Menschen als anstrebenswert äh, erscheinen, wie Sie es gerade gesagt haben, und die positiven Psychologen würden da auch sicher applaudieren. Was meinen Sie denn als Sozialphilosophin dazu? So happiness is portrayed as a measurable size. Neuroscience makes happiness visible with neuroscanning the brain. Happiness can also be tracked it with the right mood tracking apps. And what Martin Seligman, one of the leading members of the positive psychology has developed a happiness formula. So 90% is individual, 10% just external. Yeah? So if happiness becomes measurable, it's obvious that it has to become a personal task, a school subject, a social goal, and so on, educationally producible. 
So that, that sounds very nice because we can make something out of it. You can manage your happiness level. Yeah? Uh, what is your opinion or probably doubt as a social philosopher about it? Uh, um, I, I think that these, um, th this new science or, uh, well, it, it's, not, it's unfair, that's not Zeligman or not the science of happiness. I think one of the main um, struggles right now in neoliberal culture at large is around the issue of the responsibility and agency of the individual. Um, so, you know, how you um, ascribe causes to what, uh, to the experience, to our experience, is chiefly political. Um, how you um, are accountable or not accountable for um, your suffering, for example, is chiefly political. Because, um, I don't know, if, uh, you know, I don't know, if a woman's, you know, Betty Friedan, when Betty Friedan wrote The Feminine Mystique, uh, what basically she said is, we are not, all of us, or the women living in the suburbs, a bunch of neurotic, hysterical women as um, they imagine themselves to be, but we are suffering from a social condition, which is the invisibility and devaluation of women and the fact that women can only be at home and um, clean uh, their home for their husband to come uh, in the evening. So she really shifted what she made, what she did, was to shift the frame of explanation of w what it was that so many of these women who were living in the suburbs were suffering from. And so I think we are, one of the things I've been trying to do in my work was to put this issue of account, and I'm not the only one, by the way, lots of people have been doing that, um, is to shift this issue of accounts and to highlight the ways in which there is a struggle between psychology on the one hand and sociology or a big part of sociology, I think. Uh, psychology in general, but happiness studies in particular, uh, wants us to be responsible for almost anything that happens to us. Um, and in fact, that's almost the only way that psychology could be a profitable enterprise. It is precisely by putting forward this idea that they can help us take a, take a grip on ourselves. And this is obviously an idea that is eagerly uh, capitalized on by, you know, very roughly, uh, people who believe in neoliberalism, that is, in the power of the individual to shape her destiny. Mm -hmm. um, this is very, uh, very different from my own understanding of how we should account for, um, for ordinary people's lives. And my understanding is that uh, most of us have very little freedom to actually act, um, not only on our social circumstances, but most uh, crucially on our psyche, um, on our psyche. I mean, the, 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 the margins of maneuver are very much, much smaller. And um, this is one of the reasons why sociologists are often disliked in the public arena, because they are viewed as people who in a way, deny the mythology of the self-made individual. Glück ist zu einer individuellen Pflicht geworden, Sie schreiben ein Diktat. Wenn jetzt Glück seine soziale und politische Dimension verliert, wer zieht daraus den Vorteil und wer gehört zu den Verlierern? Also happiness has become an individual duty, as you wrote, a dictate, 
what happens is it loses its political and its social dimension, societal dimension. Who then takes the advantage and who then becomes a loser under such a dictate of happiness? Um, I think the, the, you know, the, I think, for example, the, the gilets jaunes are people, I, my, well, it's a theory that have absolutely no proof of, um, I think a lot of the people who went out and demonstrate are people who have accumulated a sense of shame for not being more successful. And a sense that this is a shame they have no one to share it with. Um, I don't have Facebook, but the little, very little I know of Facebook, I was really struck always by, when I looked at Facebook pages, is that people are always glowing and smiling and hyper-positive. So positivity has become a very widespread affect, not only in enterprises, in corporations, where now you have a new category of job, which is the chief happiness officer, not the chief executive officer, but chief happiness officer, and the function of that person is to make the workers of the enterprise happy. Um, so not only are corporations seizing on the topic of happiness, uh, as a way to, of course, better control, I think, the workforce. Um, but social media also, or a part of social media, self-presentation, has made um, positive affect as a, um, I would say, a signal of social success. Uh, you have to be positive in order to exude uh, the kind of uh, um, the the kind yeah, I don't know I want to say almost well although Trump is not wouldn't call him a positive person but in order not to be a loser uh, you would have to exude that kind of positive affect so so I think there is if you want a new uh, imperative which is to uh, manage your negative feelings on your own because negative feelings are by contrast to the positive affect uh, more and more constructed as expressions of your own failure to, uh, to manage yourself. Uh, so not only, there is not only an objective failure uh, which you, who you are and what you managed or didn't manage to do in your life but also a failure to manage yourself adequately um, so that I think, so there are new lines, uh, there are new, I would say, yeah, there are new, new ways of building hierarchies um, through emotions. And this is, um, this has been in the doing for the last 30 years where corporations more and more uh, recruit according to the emotional makeup of, the, of people through uh, emotional tests. And so people have become highly aware that their um, emotional makeup will make them move upward or not in the corporate hierarchy. So it's really, that's what I call an emotional capital. It's really something you want to work on in order for it to yield benefits. Mm. Believe me, I have left out two-thirds of my questions this evening. It's really true. Now, last question, because we are already very long. Sie haben das Buch des Glücksdiktat Ihrem Vater Emil Heim und Ihren Kindern Nathanael, Immanuel und Amitai gewidmet, die Ihnen, wie Sie schreiben, sehr viel mehr geben als Glück. Was ist denn größer für Sie als Glück? You have dedicated your book, Hippocrates, to your father, Emil Chaim, and your three children, Nathaniel, Emmanuel, and Amitai, who give me much more than happiness. Of what kind is that much more? <laughs> what is for you greater than happiness? Um, well, my father was um, a deeply religious uh, Jew and, um, and had a very strong sense of moral conviction. 
Um, so I guess what I, res I, my, I learned from him was that sense of, uh, of moral conviction. And my father was, I think, a re would have been completely impervious and totally indifferent to the question of whether a moral choice would make him happy or unhappy. So totally anti-utilitarian anti in that sense. Um, the, the question of happiness just never was never an issue. There was simply an issue of whether what was the right thing to do. And even if you have to be miserable for doing the right thing, you just did it, and he did it uh, unthinkingly, I would say. To be true to himself. As a, no, no, he would never use the word true yeah. to oneself. <laughs> yeah. But he would just, he, he had these principles, religious and moral principles, and it's not because he would, it was about himself, on the contrary. It was because these principles were about a transcendence that he believed in. Um, and so even if abiding by these principles did not make him happier, he, he didn't care. So I think, um, so I think, may, I think for me, the, the power of moral conviction, um, this I learned I, maybe from my father and my children, you know, it's, um, well, anyone who has children knows that um, you don't raise children it's not always fun. It can often be actually quite taxing. Truly. <laughs> um, but enormously meaningful. Uh, and so raising children or having children is, for me, a marvelous example of how you can do something enormously meaningful that can make you sometimes, that can constrain you, makes you unfree, and often is a significant um, um, decrease in your well-being and happiness. And yet, you know, you do it very gladly. So, but there's something greater to what is given to you. Es gibt etwas Größeres, was Sie dazu bekommen. Ne? That's, I think, what I call meaningfulness, exactly that. Yes, meaningfulness. So, yeah, so for me, what's more important than happiness is those... Um, is those meaningful actions or choices that may or may not be connected to your own well-being. It doesn't matter. Dennis Wedel hat einmal gesagt, uh, Glück kann nicht bereist, nicht besessen, nicht verdient, nicht getragen oder verbraucht werden. Glück ist die spirituelle Erfahrung, jede Minute mit Liebe, Gnade und Dankbarkeit zu leben. Dennis Wedel said once, Happiness cannot be traveled to, owned, earned, worn, or consumed. Happiness is the spiritual experience of living every minute with love, grace, and gratitude. Eva Illutz, thank you for coming. Thank you for the talk. Thank you.